Welcome, welcome, one and all, to Rick's Compendium of Fantastical Pseudoscience, Monsters and Beasties from the Star Trek Mythos. I'm trying a new intro, what do you think? Anyway, this bestiary is looking into the space-dwelling organism encountered by the crew of the Enterprise D in 2367, that in canon is unnamed. In other works it was called a Gekli, so that's the term I'm going to use. Starfleet has catalogued many Cosmozoans, or beings that live quite happily in the void of space, and due to the extreme requirements to survive there, you know, because of the vast nothingness and radiation, such beings tend to be very different from even the strangest organic life that lives planetside. As usual, I will mention what is canon from what is apocryphal in this video, as they only turn up in one Trek episode. The creature itself is rather large, even as an infant. They are around 40 metres long at birth, with the adult mother being easily many times that. Infants grew rapidly, increasing by almost 10% in only three hours, with ample energy to feed on. Exact measurements were never mentioned on screen, but it was easily on the same scale as a Galaxy-class starship. The beings had brown and tan mottled skin with purplish hues to it, and a frilled edge that undulated when they were in motion and expelled energy. The outer layer of skin was various silicates, actinides, and carbonaceous chondrites, which impeded clear sensor readings. They had a blunt snout, and their body tapered to a long tail with a club-like mass at the end. In Star Trek Online, the male of the species also was seen to grow horn-like ridges from its snout down its back. The being emitted a strong asymmetric radiation field of an unknown energy, but they seemed internally to have a mass of plasma. Like energy plasma, not blood. I said very different in order to survive in space. They fed off of energy and matter, both consuming the mineral content of asteroids to form their outer skin carapace and a myriad of cosmic radiations to fuel itself. Internally, they consisted of several chambers that stored and utilised this energy for a multitude of uses, including propulsion. By expelling gamma particles, they could move at speeds eclipsing half impulse even as a child. They could also expel low levels of energy to feel a target, giving it a cursory scan. It seems that alongside posture and changing colour, they also communicated by transmitting radio waves. In terms of defence, they were actually rather fragile species. A single phaser shot from a starship, even at low yield, would be enough to kill them, much to Picard's dismay. They could, however, emit a powerful dampening field, coupled with an intense radiation blast that, with prolonged exposure, would prove lethal. This was a danger to even starships, as the dampening field would take down shielding and could even prevent escape. It could be that the lethality of the phaser had nothing to do with the level of power, and more to do with an adverse reaction to the unnatural energy type, of phased Nadian streams messing with its natural equilibrium. In 2367, the Enterprise encountered several of this species in the Alpha Omicron system, an unexplored region at the time. This encounter resulted in the unfortunate death of one of them, but the successful saving of its child, nicknamed Junior, and its return to the Gekli herd. Despite the tragedy, Starfleet was able to gather much information on their life cycle and observe their behaviour for years to come. While in a system rich with food, they tended to spread out and feed, and the mother that was encountered had separated herself from the herd in order to give birth, it seems. As with many animals, the pregnant mother became very wary of the unknown, and it would attack if it felt threatened with its radiation burst. A herd of Gekli would adopt an infant without quarrel if the mother perished, allowing it to easily join their ranks. One mystery to me remained unanswered in the series, and it's one that a lot of Cosmozoans share. The idea of interstellar travel. Sure, they're able to survive in space, but that's a really big back garden, and getting around would be a hassle. 
so either they have the time to drift around at sublight speeds from place to place, meaning they'd have to be many millennia old, or they have their own method of FTL travel. In the case of the Geckly, Extra Canonical Content says that after they have amassed enough energy from feeding, they can create their own short warp jumps to travel to another system in search of further sustenance. Certainly, Junior didn't seem perturbed by the Enterprise travelling at high speeds when it was getting a ride, but it was a newborn that presumably didn't know any better, so maybe that's a null point. Tales go on to say that the Geckly are in fact native to the dimensional plane known as fluidic space, and only stumble into our universe through the same sort of apertures that allowed Species 8472 to enter. This was discovered with an exploratory mission conducted in the 25th century, and also came with a second surprise. There was another species, called the Halasa, that had a symbiotic relationship with the Geckly, or Great Ones as they called them. They would dwell inside the creature and protect it from attackers as best they could, and in return, the Geckly would provide transportation and a place to live. However, this entire subplot has been lost to one of Star Trek Online's many story revamps, so the part about the Halasa seems to have been retconned out of even memory beta existence. It's been quite often that this bestiary looks into hostile aliens of Star Trek sentient or not, so it's nice to actually address a species that is rather more like a simple space animal than some others. As with many, however, the intelligence of the creature was never truly charted, but it seemed beholden to its instincts over any real sentience. The only aggression posed by the Geckly was when it assumed it and its child were in danger and the accidental draining of power caused by Junior. Aside from this, they seem to be a relatively benign species, one that Starfleet makes frequent attempts to protect as well as shepherd them away from locations that may prove hostile to a Geckly herd. I quite like the addition that they come from fluidic space, their form certainly looks the part as well as the colour scheme resembling species 8472, but I'm not sold on the Hylasa symbiosis, just as well as that it's no longer part of STO canon, let alone Prime Trek continuity. So thanks for watching this Trek bestiary, and I hope to see you next time for another lore, review or gameplay video. I've been Rick, thanks again, and goodbye.